Hello everyone, Karnasa here, and welcome back to Kerbal Gets A Real. We're now in 1967 Part 1. Well, we're going to be continuing with our operations at the Ellen Cox Memorial Station, hopefully to pave the way for conglomerates in the future. We've also got a Venus transfer window coming up this year, as well as a Saturn one, and we are going to be sending along a few spacecraft in those transfer windows. So I mentioned a Saturn transfer window, so obviously we're going to be starting off this episode in the vehicle assembly building just so we can actually build something to go along to Saturn. I don't have anything built up yet, so we are going to be spending a little bit of time in the VAB. Now what this is going to be, well the name is TOLD, T-O-L-D, and that stands for the Titan Orbiter and Landing Device. That's right. We're not just going to go to Saturn, no, we are going to go to Saturn and we are going to attempt to both orbit and land on Titan. So, what this stage is that I'm working on currently is going to be the orbiter. And obviously, because we are going to Saturn, well, we're going to need a massive old antenna on that thing because Saturn is very, very far away. We're going to fill it up with absolutely all of the cutting edge scientific technology that we have, which to be honest, I don't think is actually any more advanced than I have done with any recent interplanetary probes that I've done. I know I am unlocking some new science soon, but I don't think this orbiter will have any of that lovely new stuff on it. So one thing about this episode, I spent an awful, awful long time in the vehicle assembly building. So obviously I am working on told here. I've not included all of the VAB sections in this video because it would have taken a really long time. And actually one of the projects that I worked on in the vehicle assembly building is going to be conglomerate, which stands for Carnassus outstanding, not clickbait, gamer lounge of many excellent resources and triumphant elapses. Thank you very crew of Astros. Thank you very much. In fact, Crew of Astros for coming up with that name. Now, the reason why I haven't shown me building that is, well, I want it to remain a little bit of a secret until it's revealed in the great reveal when we actually send that over to the moon. It is going to be the first lunar base that we construct. And actually, I don't think it's going to take an awful long time for us to do that. So, I mean, like I have mentioned, I have designed it. I have also designed a power module for it as well. And obviously the Ellen Cox Memorial Station is now in place to, well, get astronauts over to there to then land them on the moon. And what we're going to be seeing in this episode as well, I did mention in the beginning, we are going to be expanding that station. And one thing that we will be sending, which I think I did mention last episode, is going to be our reusable lunar lander. Now, that's going to be very exciting. So we are, we are getting very close to being able to put people on the moon for an extended duration of time. I think the worst, well, the hardest thing that I had, well, an issue with when designing Conglomerate was actually figuring out how I'm going to get enough battery power on that, well, base. I don't want to use RTGs because obviously they're nuclear and radiation is bad for our astronauts. They're going to be irradiated enough with the very little protection that they're going to have on the surface of the moon from all of that deadly radiation from the sun. So we don't want to be exacerbating that problem by adding RTGs or anything like that. No. So one of the things that I did do, I did use solar panels. Unfortunately, the moon being the moon, well, it's dark for 14 days of the month. so. We need a very, very, very big battery, and that's what the power module is going to be for. It's going to be a massive battery. And actually, I have had to go in and design a new launch vehicle just for conglomerate and for the power module because they are large. I needed to design a 200 ton to low Earth orbit launch vehicle to actually get those up to low Earth orbit. So I've not got a name for those yet, if anyone has a name for an absolute behemoth of a launch vehicle, why not leave it down in the comments? And yeah, hopefully we can name this thing together. So, as I was mentioning, we are getting ready to go and put our lunar surface outpost down on the moon. So, I went into mission control and actually picked up the contract. So, <laughs> yeah, so I've got a deadline now. 
We've got a timer on it. It's five years, and I'm fairly certain we will probably get Conglomerate down in 1968, maybe even 1967 part two. I'm not sure yet, but most of the infrastructure is in place. But anyway, here we are with the first actual mission of 1967. This is going to be Co-Ed, which was the Co Co Callisto Orbiter, an exploration device on the 18th of January. So this is just a deep space maneuver in order to actually get us a lot closer to Callisto. I believe this deep space maneuver was to change our inclination so that when we arrived at Jupiter, it was more in the plane of Callisto rather than being polar or whatever it was before. It wasn't very good before, but whilst I was here, I was figuring out if I had enough Delta V to actually capture at Callisto. And you know what? It actually turns out that I do. So we are going to be able to orbit that moon. But we're going to be moving on now to the James Peters module on the 18th of January as well. Two things in the same day. So yes, we had the Callisto orbiter and now we've got the James Peters module launched on top of an Icarus Super 66. This is, as I mentioned in the last episode, exactly the same as the Bonnie Ellis module. It's just gonna be on the opposite side of the Ellen Cox Memorial Station. I like it to have, well, I would like it to have some kind of symmetry. So this module, if you didn't catch the last episode, basically it's a place for our reusable lunar landers to dock, as well as our shuttles that actually go to the Ellen Cox Memorial Station. Now, this here, I was trying to get an intersect with the station when I performed my capture burn at the moon. And you know what? I actually did manage to get an intersect, which was rather fortunate. But after having done this once, I don't think I'm ever going to do this again because it really wasn't efficient. And the way that I have been doing it later on in this episode, because we are going to be launching more stuff to the Ellen Cox Memorial Station, well, I just put myself in an orbit slightly higher than the ECMS and then that way we can let that catch up to us wherever it is in its orbit and it makes it a lot easier, I feel like it's a lot more efficient, see we go shooting right past it here which is why I don't really want to try this again was a bit of a waste really and it just took a really long time to actually rendezvous with the station but actually docking with the station was a lot quicker than when we docked the Bonnie Ellis module. No, this for some reason went a lot better. So with the successful docking of the James Peters module, the ECMS is now looking rather splendid indeed. It's looking very big indeed, and it is definitely getting to where we want it to be. Another module that I do want to add is a few Aerozine and NTO tanks, just so that we can refill up those landers that we are going to be placing on there. But we're going to quickly come back to New Dawn 1 now for its Ganymede encounter maneuver on the 27th of January 1967. Now, this is taking a really long time to do this mission because obviously my Apple apps at Jupiter was really high. In order to try and squeeze out as much Delta V from this craft as I could to get our Ganymede encounter. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm actually trying to change my inclination to a polar one when I get to Ganymede. That way, when we actually reach there and we're going to orbit it, which we are going to orbit it, well, we're going to go over every single biome. So we're going to get as much science from Ganymede as we possibly can. And now it's just a quick stop off at the Space Center before we go to the reusable lunar lander. So here we have the ECMS lander module on the 10th of February 1967, once again launched on an Icarus Super 66. They are my super heavy launch vehicle and we have been using them a rather large amount in this episode. It seems that all of the missions that I am doing, well, we need to be able to lift an awful lot into low Earth orbit. But there we go, we can actually kind of see the lander now. There it is, just on the end. We're using that Minotaur stage to actually propel us to the moon, performing our translunar injection. And, well... It's just a standard TLI, isn't it? So there we go. We have once again got an encounter with the moon. And now, like I said, I am not going to try and go for a direct rendezvous 
with the ECMS. Now, like I also mentioned, we are going to put ourselves in a slightly higher orbit. We're gonna use that Minosaur stage once again to slow us down, to actually capture at the moon. And I believe we're also gonna smash that Minotaur stage back into the surface of the moon, but I'm not gonna show that. I've shown that enough on this series already. There we go, we can see we have our encounter with the ECMS once we have performed just a quick little burn with this, well, kind of orbital maneuvering stage that we've got on this craft. There it is coming flying in, looking rather large now. So I had enough Delta V, obviously on the lander. It has loads of Delta V on it because, well, we want to land on the moon and return in one stage. That's what this lander will do. It's a reusable, it's completely reusable. All we have to do is fill it up with fuel every now and then. But I didn't want to use that fuel because obviously I wanted to save it for when we actually landed on the moon. But there we go. We have connected up the first lander. Now that we have our lander module on board the ECMS, well, actually, one thing that we do have on there that we haven't actually sorted out yet is we've got the original crew. And because the original crew are still on there, well, we haven't completed our first Lunar Space Station contract. I have also gone into Mission Control and picked up a contract to rotate the crew. So that's exactly what we're going to be doing next. And then we can complete that contract as well as finally completing that first Lunar Space Station contract. So here we have, on the 28th of February 1967, the ECMS crew number two, once again on top of an Icarus Super 66. Now we have seen so many launches of these, so we're gonna skip right through that. Here we are performing our translunar injection to go actually get us to the moon. Now this isn't going to do what the ECMS-1 did. We're not gonna pick up a crewed lunar orbit with three. No, we are going to go directly to the Ellen Cox Memorial Station because well, we want to get that original crew back rather desperately because we are going to get an awful lot of money once we bring them safely back home. Because actually, they've still not fulfilled that crewed lunar orbit with three. So, well, we've got so many contracts that we're going to complete with this. And the first one, obviously, is going to be rotate the crew. Here we are just capturing ourselves at the moon now. Now, once again, I have put us in a slightly higher orbit than the Ellen Cox Memorial Station, just to make it easy to rendezvous with that craft. But I have skipped out most of the maneuver planning and all of the burns in between, just to show you that we got this craft safely over to the Ellen Cox Memorial Station. And now I think this is what, the fifth thing that we've docked to this thing? Let me see if I can count. One, two, three, four, five, <laughs> yeah. So this is really starting to get rather large now, but there we go. We have brought a new crew to the ECMS. And now what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna send the old crew home because obviously we don't want to keep six astronauts on board this station for a particularly long amount of time. We can actually keep six astronauts on this station for a long time. We can keep six astronauts on here for more than a year. That's how much those additional life support modules, the Bonnie Ellis wing and the James Peter wing actually provide. But we managed to bring the old crew back down safely and landed on the ground rather than splashing down. So with that success, we earned a stupid amount of money, an absolutely gargantuan, I can't think of a good word to describe it, but we earned an awful lot of money. We can see we now have well over 7 million funds. So I'm actually going to build ourselves a new super heavy launch pad because I have a feeling that when we want to start sending crewed missions to Mars, we are definitely going to need more than one of those. So that's why I've done that. And actually, I think what I'm going to end up doing is probably have four of those when I can afford it. And then I know that I can always launch super heavies whenever I want. But now it looks like our Venus transfer window has come up. So here we have on the 6th of May, 1967, Vescan 1 on quite frankly, a derelict launch vehicle. It is the Icarus 1. And the reason why we are launching this on an Icarus 1 is if you can remember, 
The first time that we attempted to launch Vescan in the last Venus transfer window, well, it didn't go particularly well. No, I forgot to add RCS and I forgot to configure the actual RCS that was on that craft. But we've got rapid launches because here is Vescan 2 a day later on the 7th of May. Once again, also on an Icarus 1. So Vescan 1 has an altimetry scanner and Vescan 2 has a biome scanner. And I'm going to try and rush through these launches rather quickly because there isn't a particularly lot of interesting material here. It's just launches of launch vehicles that we've seen a lot. So the aim for these missions is to actually scan Venus, both an altimetry scan and a biome scan. Now I know we do have, well, Ms. Boo, which is going to Mars. That is a mission that has been done all in one. Well, I didn't do that for Venus because at the time I wasn't sure if I could. So that's why we've got two of these going. But Vescan 2 is now on its way, which leads us to Venereal. Uh, on the 8th of May, 1967. Now this is being launched on a relatively new launch vehicle with the Adventurer 2. So Venereal uh, is going to be our Venus rover. Now, this was the rover that I designed in the last build episode. And one thing that I didn't really mention in the build episode, when I was actually building this, well, I took great care to make sure that every single part that went on this rover would be able to withstand the heat at Venus. Obviously, it is very hot, and a lot of the parts aren't able to actually survive on the surface of Venus. So that is one thing that I want to add from the build episode. Yes, I did make sure that everything on this rover will be able to last on Venus. So the aim of this mission, it's just a Venus rover. We're gonna go to Venus and hopefully we're gonna go by a lot of the biomes just by going there using Bon Voyage. But isn't that an absolutely spectacular shot of the United States there as we perform a slight course adjustment so we can really fine tune our encounter at Venus. So that's three craft on their way to Venus. And now the way this has worked out, well, 1967 part two is going to be an incredibly busy half to the year. I thought 1967 part one was busy, but no. As it turns out, our Mars captures are all gonna fall in 1967 part two. Our Venus captures are all gonna fall in 1967 part two. We're also gonna capture at Saturn, so it's gonna be busy indeed. But anyway, we're now gonna move on to the Lunar Uber. So here we have the Lunar Shuttle 1 on the 12th of May, 1967. Not long at all after we did our Venus transfer window. Now I have dubbed this launch vehicle the Uber 1, but I'm not sure if I'm going to keep that name. This is a purpose-built launch vehicle for this mission. So actually what I'm gonna do is I'm going to show the entire ascent. Basically, I wanted a cheap rocket to actually get us over to the Ellen Cox Memorial Station. And this thing is more than capable of doing that. So on the first stage, we have two E1 engines supplemented by the much, well, much larger F1A engine. Then we have two HD3 engines on this second stage. Now, unfortunately, this isn't going to quite get us into orbit. So what we're gonna have to do is we are gonna have to use a bit of our translunar injection stage to actually orbit ourselves. And actually, because of that, that stage no longer has enough Delta V in it to actually get us all the way to the moon. So we're gonna have to use our capture stage to get us to the moon, which, it's got 15 ignitions on the engine that we are using, so that's not terrible, and that capture stage is definitely overbuilt. The idea of this mission will be eventually to meet up with the Ellen Cox Memorial Station. That's not what we're gonna do with this mission. No, this is just going to perform a lunar orbit so we can complete that contract and send these back. Now, you may have noticed that actually, we have solar panels, and you may have seen before, they pop through the fairings. That's what I mean about auto-deploy solar panels on generic fairings. Well, yeah, it doesn't work quite nicely a lot of the time. But anyway, we have made it to the moon with this new craft. So we're just gonna spend a little bit of time around here whilst we fulfill that contract before going home. Now, the sudden change in music. That's because something a bit funny happened with this mission. 
Well, we've definitely got power because those solar panels are more than capable. I, I think what I really wanted to try and go for with this craft was very Orion-esque. So this is what was odd. I detached our capsule and for some reason, well, the RCS didn't work. So we are going into the atmosphere nose down. Now, obviously if this was, well, real life, this thing would be toast. This thing would definitely not survive, but I think because the Apollo capsule, the way it's built in the game, it kind of works that the whole thing is heat resistant up to a certain point, which is why our astronauts actually survived this. We did skip off though, unfortunately, and we did run out of electricity by the end of this, but we still managed to get down safely. However, we did lose that forward heat shield. I was very fortunate that the parachutes didn't burn up. But yeah, that, that was really bizarre. So I think I am going to have to go back to the drawing board and figure out what went wrong there. Well, at least we managed to get those three astronauts safely back home because that would have been terrible if we would have lost another three in, well, not even a year after we lost Ellen Cox, Bonnie Ellis and James Peters. So... Yeah, no, I, I don't want another death for at least a good five years. Can, can we have five years where nothing goes wrong, please? That would be really, really nice. But yeah, no, we are going to have to redesign that Luna Uber. And I have gone in already and hopefully I have fixed the issue. But we'll have to see the next time we launch that. I mean, I probably should test it in Crash. Always test in Crash. How many times do I say it and how many times do I not listen to myself? <laughs> it, yeah, no, I should, I should listen to my own advice and really try that thing out. So here we have the last launch of 1967 part one, TOLD on the 23rd of June, 1967. So this is the Titan orbiter and landing device. Once again, we are launching this on top of an Icarus Super 66. I didn't really talk much about the design of this in the actual design section of this video, but yeah, we are launching this on an Icarus Super 66. We do have a Minotaur stage to perform our Saturn burn. And well, the reason is why we need such a large launch vehicle is because this is actually a really large craft. We needed 7,500 meters per second of Delta V to get to Saturn. And obviously, we've got a rather large capture stage and lander, which has all kinds of heat shields on it. So it is really heavy, which is why we did need the big craft. It is a very expensive craft though. I am hoping when we get to Titan and we get a Titan flyby and a Titan landing, we should earn our money back though. That remains to be seen. That definitely remains to be seen. But here you go. We can see we've got ourselves a nice encounter with Saturn and we're just gonna leave this to float in space for the next seven years. So yeah, that's gonna take a really long time to get to Saturn. So <laughs> we are gonna leave that in space for around seven years. But you know what? With that launch, that is actually the end of, well, the first half of 1967. And you may have seen, I got a little bit excited there and actually we're on the 2nd of July rather than the 1st of July. I was kind of kicking myself off doing that. I like to finish on the first day, but unfortunately I couldn't. So that is the end of this episode. And I guess if you have enjoyed this episode, why not give it a like? If you have really enjoyed this episode and would like to continue with the content on my channel, please do consider subscribing. I have been Karnasa and I will see you later. <laughs>